Good morning. I want to greet you, each one in Christ's name this morning. Turn with me to Daniel chapter 8. I'm going to continue in my study through the book of Daniel. Um, we'll see how it goes this morning. I had planned to um, look at both Daniel chapter 8 and 10 with uh, starting a bit late here. I may just go through Daniel 8. Um, we'll see here. But I was basically going to have too many messages because I didn't, Daniel chapter 8 and Daniel chapter 10, neither of the chapters were really long enough to have one message out of. But let's see how far we get here this morning. Daniel chapter 8, beginning at verse 1. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared unto me, even unto me, Daniel, after that which appeared unto me at first. And I saw in a vision, and it came to pass, when I saw that I was at Shushan in the palace, which is in the province of Elam, and I saw a vision, and I was by the river Uliah. So as we look through Daniel here, some of the things to keep in mind is that they're not, the chapters aren't all chronologically placed in there. I think I may have mentioned this in another message, but the first six chapters of Daniel, we go through there, and it's more of the stories and the dreams he told. Then as we go through the second half of the book, it's more his visions of the future events. So the other was what was happening currently in his life. Now we're in the second half of the book. We're looking at what happened later, but we still want to think about, I wanted to think about this morning, who the rulers are at this time when he gets the vision and where Daniel is. We know that he was captured as a boy taken to Babylon and the first ruler, the, the ruler that was in charge at that time was Nebuchadnezzar. Later, Belshazzar was another ruler, but still in Babylon. Babylon was still the kingdom that was controlling the, the known world at that time there that went from Europe to China. Then the third uh, and final king was Darius of the Medes and Persians, and we've already covered some of that history there, but when God wrote on the wall and Daniel was called in, that was right when Belshazzar's rule ended, the Babylonian period ended, and the Medes and the Persians came in. So how many know where ancient Babylon is located? Micah, modern day, where is it today? Iraq, eastern Iraq. How many know where Persia is located today? Anybody in school taking geography? Where's Persia today? I know the school teachers will know, but... Where was the empire of the Medes and Persians? Where is that today? Iran, which is located just east of Iraq. So when you think of Babylon, you think of Iran. Iraq and Iran are right next to each other today. So these distances were not that great, but yet they were revolutionary in the sense that the, 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 just the miracle, the idea that Daniel would rise to the top of the Babylonian Empire, then that empire would be taken over by the Medes and the Persians from the area of Iran, and he would once again rise to the top. I believe we can see God's working there in Daniel's life and making that happen. Now for this message this morning, um, some of the chapters in Daniel, when I would study them, it came very easy. This one I spent hours and hours trying to read uh, not just the scriptures and trying to put it all together, but also reading um, secular history and how it ties in with 
what was going on. So I believe, I want to say that this morning, some of you may get tired as we go through some of these books, some of these chapters, but I believe it helps me as a, as a minister that forces me to dig in and research some of these chapters that maybe I would just avoid if I wasn't doing the book by book study also. Obviously I enjoy the other, the topical messages, but I think it's good for us to look at this and learn things and think about what was going on at that time. So as we see here in verse 2 of Daniel chapter 8, it mentions that he was at Shushan in the palace. How many can think of where else in the Bible we hear of the name Sushan? Does that sound familiar? A palace in Sushan? Esther. Esther. Very good. So, was this the same palace? I did a lot of reading. I believe it was. And later on, we're going to actually look at Alexander the Great. And they believe that he married his second and third wives in this same palace. So there's a lot of history that took place here. But this was a palace of the Medes and Persians, even though Babylon was currently ruling over that area. Later, the Medes and Persians would take over that area of the world. And this palace was still played prominently. Later, the Babylon or the the Greece, the Grecians would take over through Alexander the Great, and he would once again continue to use this palace. So a lot happened there. So it's fascinating. I'm not going to take time for lack of time this morning. You can look at it later, but if you write down Esther 1, verses 1 to 2, and Esther 2, verses 5 to 7, you will see, you'll see a familiar story taking place in this same palace now, one of the things I wanted to look at this morning, how much time separated Daniel and Esther? Were they alive at the same time? Anyone here know? No, they, there was about two generations, about 50, 60 years at least, that separated them. But Esther came after Daniel, so one of the things I had to think about, I, I enjoy history, I enjoy thinking about if I'm in an old building, who, who lived here before, who worked here before, who, you know, went through struggles. It's one of the reasons I enjoy living in old houses. Maybe I enjoy living in old houses more than I do would in a brand new one because of thinking, you know, other people sweated, worked hard, went through struggles. And so I have to wonder, we don't have anything in scripture telling us or even any secular historical books to tell us, but did Esther realize that she was walking in the same place that Daniel did? But they said they were separated by a, a couple of generations. Another fascinating thing about this palace in Shushan where Daniel was given this, this dream or vision, this vision, this prophecy, is that it's located about 300, 350 miles from another current place. And now I, I should have wrote it down, I should have wrote the name down, but it starts with the B, but it's currently a uh, nuclear reactor where Iran is making nuclear product to attempt to make um, nuclear bombs to attack Israel today. So the same area, the region of, of Iran where Haman plotted to destroy the Jews during Esther's time, today Iranians are still plotting to kill the Jews today. As someone says that I enjoy listening to, history not only repeats, it rhymes. And so it's just fascinating what was taking place back then. Let's go on now, Daniel chapter 8, verse 3. When I lifted up mine eyes and saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram which had two horns, and the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other. The higher came up last. I saw the ram pushing westward and northward and southward, so that no beast might stand before him. Neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand, but he did according to his will and became great. And as I was considering, behold, a he-goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth and touched not the ground, and the goat had no 
notable horn, had a notable horn between his eyes, and he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing before the river, and ran into him in the fury of his power. And I saw him come close unto the ram, and he was moved with color against him, and he smote the ram, and brake his two horns, and there was no power in the ram to stand before him. But he cast him down to the ground, and stamped upon him, and there was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand. Therefore the he-goat waxed very great, and when he was strong, the great horn was broken, for it came up four notable ones towards the four winds of the heaven. And out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceeding great, towards the south, and toward the east, and towards the pleasant land. And it waxed great, even to the host of heaven. And it cast down some of the host, and of the stars to the ground, and stamped upon them. Yea, he magnified himself, even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. And an host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression, and it cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. And when I heard one saint speaking, and another saint, and said unto the certain saint which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation, to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden under foot. And he said unto me, unto, unto two thousand and three hundred days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And I'm going to pause there for a moment. So we see here God is giving Daniel future revelation of things that were going to come to pass. And if he had stopped right there, we could paint that vision, that, that, that prophecy, onto a lot of different nations and different countries. But thankfully, God does give Daniel the interpretation. And we'll see that as we go on here in verse 15. It came to pass when I, even I, Daniel, had seen the vision and sought for the meaning. Then behold, there stood before me as an appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice be between the banks of the Eli, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid and fell upon my face. But he said unto me, Understand, O son of man, for at the time of the end shall be the vision. Now as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep upon my face toward the ground, but he touched me and set me upright. And he said, Behold, I will make thee know what shall be in the last end of the indignation, for at the time appointed, and the end shall be. The ram which thou sawest, having two horns, are the kings of Media and Persia. And I'm just going to stop there for a moment. The reason I say this was future is that the beginning of the chapter, it says that this vision was given to Daniel during the reign of Belshazzar, which was still the Babylonian Empire. What is God prophesying here? to Daniel is that it was going to come to an end through the Medes and the Persians. Verse 21, the rough goat is the king of Grecia, and the great horn is between his eyes of the first king. Now when that being broken, whereas four stood up, four kingdoms shall stand out of the nation, but not in his power. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding, dark sentences shall stand up. And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully, and shall prosper and practice, and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. And through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand. And he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. And he shall stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. And the vision of the evening and the morning which was told is true. Therefore shut thou up the vision for it shall be for many days. And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick certain days. Afterward I rose up and did the king's business, and I was astonished at the vision, but none understood it. So why was God showing Daniel what was to come? What was the purpose I believe that part of it is, and is when we go and look at chapter 10, which I don't believe we're going to have time for today, 
I think Daniel, his love for his, the Jewish people and the desire to see God's will to be done through his people, I think Daniel, Daniel understood. We looked at chapter 9 last December at Christmas time when God gives Daniel the vision of the coming Messiah. I think Daniel understood there was a need for redemption of God's people that God's people could not remain under the rule of other nations, even though they deserved it. We looked at that in the past also, where Daniel cried out for his people, but he understood that they deserved it because of their falling away from God. But yet, Daniel had a love for the Jewish people and for God, and it drove him to want to know what God was going to do and how he was going to bring it all together, as you can say, put it all together in one piece that made sense. Because Daniel knew that if the Jewish people never had a way of redeeming themselves back to their nation, then it was a, it was a, it made God look bad. It was a slam to him. So his desire was to see this. So as well, we're just going to take a few minutes here to dig into this a little bit. So as I said earlier, we saw there in verse 19 and 20, the prophecies of the conquest of Babylon by the Medes and Persians. I think it may have been one of the reasons why at the end of the chapter there we see that Daniel was supposed to shut up the vision or it seems like he was, he was not supposed to just let everyone know about it. And I think there was, there was a time and a place where that vision would be revealed, but right then was not it. In verse 21, Daniel says that eventually the Medes and Persians will be conquered by another one. And if you go to modern uh, uh, encyclopedias and you look at world history, there would be a king that would come out of Grecia or Greece. How many know who that king was? I'm sure, yeah. Alexander the Great. And why is it significant? Why why was let's say why was the prophecy not about his father or some of the other kings of Greece? Well, and I'll I'll get into it more in chapter ten, but all these prophecies that God gave Daniel were about nations that had control over the land of Israel. And I think that's why Alexander was the next one mentioned. Alexander would defeat the Medes and Persians, but he was also the next kingdom that would control the land of Israel. And so as we see here through the chapter, it talks about what all Alexander the Great would do it says that he would never be able to be defeated. How many know how many uh, battles, maybe I'm going into too many history details, how many battles he won was something on the order of like 20 battles. He never lost a battle. And here it says that he would not be defeated. So how did he die? Either It was either through poisoning or through an illness. But he was never defeated in battle, even though he took on the immense kingdom of the Medes and Persians. But from him, if you read, if you can go into Wikipedia and look up Alexander the Great and look at when he died, it would say that his kingdom then was broken up into four different kingdoms. And we see that here um, in verse 8. In, chapter, in Daniel chapter 8, verse 8. And therefore he gra the goat waxed very great, and when he was strong, a great horn was broken, and for it came up no four notable ones towards the four winds of the heaven. Those four were the Potomac Egypt, Cilicia, Mesopotamia, and Central Asia, Attalid, Antinolia, and Atagonid, Mas Macedon or Macedonian, the area of Greece today. So those, just as God prophesied through Daniel, centuries later, 
God would use Alexander the Great to defeat the Medes and Persians, and then he would, defeat, he would be broken up, his kingdom would be broken up into four. That kingdom would then go into the Roman Empire, which would be the kingdom that would be there when Jesus came on the scene. And that's the next chapter of Daniel, Daniel chapter 9. So these chapters here that we're looking at right now, 8, 9, 10, it was all chronological, and it dealt with the kingdoms of the world, but it was because of their effect on the nation of Israel. And as it talks about after the breaking up of those four kingdoms, then the last kingdom mentioned in chapter 8, I believe, was the Roman Empire. And then it would talk about how that the daily sacrifices would be. Verse 13, they were concerned about the daily sacrifice and the desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot. In AD 70, after Christ lived on the earth, died, rose again, and ascended to heaven, in AD 70, the Roman Empire would bring about the end of daily sacrifice in the Jewish temple. And their soldiers would go into the temple, into the Holy Holies. And we see that prophesied here. Why do we care about what happened back then? What effect does it have on us today? I look forward to the next message because that was sort of going to tie this back together of seeing how God works and cares about his people. Each of these kingdoms mentioned here ruled over the Jewish nation. What we'll see in later prophecies are the nation, the kingdoms that rule the world from then until now. Why does it matter to God? Because his people, the Jews, the Christian church, are under those kingdoms right now. And by showing that he knows the future and it shows his sovereignty, it shows that he cares about what happens in the world. It doesn't mean that we're going to rise up. I believe it's quite the opposite, as I've said in previous messages. But that God is sovereign and in control of it all. I wanted to close out the message this morning. This week is our national elections again. There are a lot of Christians that are excited about going out and voting and making a difference. We don't have to do that. Our kingdom is not of this world. Just as God was faithful to Daniel and the Jewish people, he's faithful to us. He cares about us, even when things seem to be going difficult. We see wars happening right now. The latest one is the Ukraine-Russia war. And it can be discouraging to see how many people are suffering and dying because of that. But yet, if we look at the life of Daniel, I think it points us to the idea that even when we may suffer, we may have uh, struggles because of what's going on around us, we can still go back to God, put our faith in him, trust him, for the future because he knows it. He wasn't surprised by any of the things that happened before Jesus came. He's not, gonna, not surprised by anything that's happened since. He's not going to be surprised by what happens this week or next. But we can trust him with our lives and with our lives of our children, grandchildren, because he is sovereign and in control. The Lord bless each one of you.